Ladies and gentlemen, uh, on behalf of the Institute of International and European Affairs, I'd like to welcome you all to uh, today's event. My name is David Donoghue. Our guest today is Svetlana Tikhanovskaya, who will speak to us on the topic of Belarus on the brink, what now? Svetlana will look at the current situation in Belarus and at possible ways forward for the opposition there, of which he is a very prominent member uh, in the aftermath of the election last year and also of the further crisis caused by the uh, Lukashenko regime's diversion of a Ryanair jet, as we know, in May and the arrest of an activist who was on board. Svetlana is perhaps uh, Belarus's best known human rights activist and opposition leader. As we all know, she stood as, as she contested the presidential election last August as the main opposition candidate uh, following the detention of her husband, Sergei Tikhanovsky. Uh, since the election and its heavily disputed results, she's been based in Lithuania as the official representative of Belarus's democratic opposition in exile. She heads the Coordination Council to facilitate a peaceful democratic transfer of power in Belarus. Before running for the presidency, she was an English teacher and interpreter. And as we, as those of us living in Ireland know, she spent a number of summers here as, as a teenager near Rosque. And in fact, Svetlana, it has been very touching, I think, for all of us to see the coverage of your reunion with your host family this week. Um, uh, You've had a very busy trip to Ireland this week, and we're all the more grateful to you for taking time out from that schedule to speak to us at the Institute. Uh, a few housekeeping points. Svetlana will be um, keeping her open, opening remarks fairly brief to about five minutes, uh, and both her uh, remarks and the Q&A session will be on the record. Please feel free to send in questions or comments as they occur to you during the session, and uh, you, you would use the Q&A function for that, which you'll see at the bottom of your screens, and we'll try to get to as many as possible. And Svetlana will be joined by her colleague, Vranek Vyachorka, uh, who is a senior advisor to her for the Q&A session. Finally, for those using Twitter, the handle is at IIEA. So with that, Svetlana, once again, you're very, very welcome. and. Uh, Please take the floor. Thank you. Uh, dear ladies and gentlemen, and uh, you know, I'm uh, deeply honored to speak in front of you today. As you know, uh, Ireland is an exceptional country for me. I was 14 when I came here for the first time as a so called Chernobyl kid. I came here three times and had a terrific summers with my host family. I saw them yesterday in Roskri and I can't express how grateful I am for their love and kindness. You know, apparently Belarus political crisis began a long time ago. In 1996, a year when I first came to Ireland, Alexander Lukashenko conducted a political coup d'etat. He endowed himself with unlimited powers. Before that, he dismissed parliament and destroyed opponents. And many alternative parties, media outlets, civil society groups uh, got destroyed. And thousands of people uh, had to flee the country and uh, look for a better future abroad. Most prominent political leaders disappeared and got killed by the regime's cronies uh, a few years later. All elections since then uh, were falsified. And it was hard to imagine that something might change in Belarus. And as an absolute majority of Belarusians, I was never involved in politics before 2020. Of course, I was following the news and I saw this horrible injustice ordinary Belarusians face daily, but I didn't see a way to change it. But it changed last year when Belarusians woke up. And after the election uh, was announced, my husband decided to run. Very soon he got jailed. Uh, so I decided to come and register instead of him. This is how I became a presidential candidate advocating for democratic reforms, 
but first of all, for the release of political prisoners. And it was already evident that the regime will not give up uh, its power. And it was also apparent uh, that people will not give up either. And on August 9th, millions of Belarusians expressed their wish for a peaceful and democratic transition of power. And predictably, uh, elections were, were stolen. And moreover, those who joined uh, the peaceful protest uh, faced rubber bullets, uh, gas, and truncheons. The protest continued despite police violence and torture. And since last August, more than 35,000 Belarusians were arrested. Hundreds were tortured, thousands criminal prosecuted, and 555 political prisoners and at least 10 died in relation to protest. Not a single case was initiated against, against the government officials for all these abuse. My husband, uh, Sergei Tikhanovsky, is one of the hundreds of political prisoners. He didn't see his children for more than one year already. My only contact uh, to him is uh, through lawyer. And of course, he can't tell everything he feels there behind the bars. But I know for sure that he is strong and uh, he will get through this. And for, you know, unfortunately, very little information gets to us from those behind the bars. Prisoners are deprived of medical assistance. There are no windows, so they can't see the sun. Letters are not delivered or delivered with a month delay. Women are stripped searched. And when you object, uh, the guards can beat you and humiliate you in front of the others. Journalist Igor Losik uh, protested against prison conditions. He almost died in 40 days hunger strike, twice committed suicide attempts. And he says uh, that he can't handle it. In one of uh, his latest letters uh, to his wife, he said that he feels like a prisoner in uh, Auschwitz. In the last two weeks, regimes thugs raided more than 30 media outlets and human rights organizations. Activists, journalists, human rights defenders, volunteers uh, got detained, beaten, charged in anti-state activists and now face years of prison. The regime is literally uh, destroying civil society. The human rights catastrophe in Belarus may uh, seem to prove the strength of the repressive machine and the weakness of the unarmed uh, resistance. But in reality, it demonstrates the weakness of the dictatorship that has no other means uh, left to keep in power but violence. And the regime tries to stop time and to return to the worst practices of the Soviet era. But Belarusians have already chosen the future as democratic and will not change their minds. You know, the crisis has outgrown Belarus borders already. The regime hijacked the Ryan airplane, organized the flow of migrants to the neighboring countries and openly threatened to flood Europe with trucks and nuclear waste. For some, it might seem as many separate problems. However, the source of problems is the same, uncountable, unpredictable, and non-transparent regime which stole elections to raise Belarusians and impose security threats to entire Europe. So I urge the international community to focus on the problem, not only the consequences. Until Belarusians have a possibility to freely choose uh, their leadership, the type of accidents, uh, attacks, provocations, and repressions against Belarusian citizens are going to continue. New free um, and fair elections this year will help to solve the crisis. Violence must end, and all political prisoners must be unconditionally released and rehabilitated. And we ask the world to support these demands. And you may ask uh, why will, uh, what will make the regime to release people and conduct free elections? My answer is pressure from inside and outside. People in the regime, and this is not about only ex-president, must feel that there is no other solution to the crisis to step down and conduct new elections. Inside the country, multiple initiatives bravely continue their work despite terror and repressions, and they need help. 
So I call on the international community to provide assistance and emergency funding for media, human rights defenders, legal defense efforts, local civic initiatives, and activists, striking committees, and emerging, uh, emerging professional associations such as athletes, cultural workers, doctors, and teachers, and of course students that are expelled for their political views. I would love to draw special attention to supporting media initiatives. Vibrant and sustainable media are the basement for a resilient and robust society. I also ask to support families of the repressed. As one of the uh, Chernobyl kids, I can say that we face now the new Chernobyl, Chernobyl of human rights. And so many Belarusians, especially children, are traumatized and in need of rehabilitation. And it would be great to develop a special program to let children or political prisoners spend time in Ireland. I also ask to support Belarusian uh, relicants and diaspora. Thousands of people were forced to leave the country, fleeing persecution last year and uh, this year. But just as the Irish abroad became a great force that helped to restore independence, the Belarusian diaspora is rapidly developing networks of solidarity all over the globe. So I welcome the support of these initiatives, especially in the sphere of culture that we uh, celebrated last week. Pressure from outside must include sanctions, international legal mechanisms, and the legitimization of the regime. And I really welcome the principled position of Ireland. And I thank you uh, and I thank your country for condemning the regime and supporting the European sanctions against it. The crackdown on media and human rights defenders must get a strong response from the international community. So now I ask to support the fifth European Union sanctions package that should include a broad list of individuals and companies and close the loopholes in the sanctions imposed recently against potash and oil sector. I also call Ireland, along with other like-minded countries, to promote the topic of Belarus at the UN Security Council. Organizing an area formal hearing on the human rights abuses and torture in Belarus can help uh, to draw attention of the world to Belarus. And it's essential to use all available international mechanisms to bring perpetrators to justice. The case of Ryanair plane hijacking should be filed to the International Court of Justice. And Ireland as an affected country can help with that. We also ask the UN Human Rights Council and the Office of the High Commissioner to put the Belarus crisis on the agenda. Even though Belarus is not a member of the International Criminal Court, preliminary examination of the regime's crimes uh, can be still launched. You know, I look in the future with optimism. One year ago, Belarusians chose to live in free and democratic Belarus. Right now, we have to protect this choice. No one will bring freedom to us, and it's our task, of course. But with international support and your solidarity, the path to freedom will be faster and less painful. And I dream that everyone who is behind bars or in post exile will be able to return home. So please help us uh, pave the way for a new democratic Belarus. Thank you and Guru Mach Agat. Thank you very much, Svetlana, and especially for the last words in Irish. You obviously put your time in Moscow to good use. <clears throat> I thought maybe you might have picked up a Tipperary accent, but uh, I'm sure um, you have very, very good memories of your time there. We have a number of questions coming in, Svetlana, and, and some comments, uh, all extremely supportive of, of what you're doing. Um, let me just first mention from uh, a, a comment from David Joyce, who is with our, the Irish trade union movement. He just wanted to underline the solidarity of Irish trade unions to you and all who are struggling for democracy and human rights in Belarus. He uh, witnessed the level of oppression at uh, a meeting of the uh, ILO in June, where the Belarus authorities openly threatened uh, uh, brothers and sisters in the independent trade union BKDP. Um, so 
basically David Joyce wants to underline uh, the, the readiness of the Irish trade union movement to do everything possible uh, in solidarity with you. Um, I uh, have a question from uh, Tom Ferris, um, which let me just read it down. Yeah, is the European Union doing enough to support the Belarusian people's struggle towards a peaceful democracy? You, you touched on that a little bit, Sir Dana, but it would be uh, useful just to talk a bit more about the EU's response as such, what has happened up to now and what could potentially still be done. Could I hand that to you? Uh, thank you. You know, I uh, really appreciate all the efforts of European Union and uh, other countries like the USA, UK and, uh, you know, the Ukraine, Canada uh, for their strong position. And uh, after August uh, event, uh, all the democratic countries declared that uh, our elections were fraudulent and they, that Lukashenko's regime is not legitimate. And it was a very... Uh, you know, supportive message to all Belarusians that the whole world with us and we continued our fight being assured that, uh, you know, uh, democratic countries will be standing uh, with us. And uh, I have to say that um, three packages of sanctions that were imposed uh, right after the elections, they were uh, more moral, I'd say. They were not strong enough, you know, and it was like, a message to regime that look we are uh, we are see, we see you and we are going to stand with Belarusians, and after this, um, especially after the uh, this picture of beautiful demonstrations, uh, it disappeared because Lukashenko, with the help of violence and guns and tortures, like uh, was succeeded to um, suppress uh, those huge demonstrations attention to Belarus was decreasing step by step. And after December, we didn't have, uh, you know, big conferences or huge attention to Belarusian question. And Lukashenko felt impunity. And uh, it uh, ends with uh, hijacking of the plane. And after this, uh, after this uh, hijacking, the uh, attention of uh, uh, democratic countries, of course, uh, raised and uh, new adequate sanctions, rather strong sanctions, uh, food package and sectoral sanctions were imposed. And, uh, uh, you know, of course it threatened uh, regime uh, because they maybe didn't ex uh, expect such a strong answer. And especially it's about uh, closing airspace uh, above uh, Belarus. Uh, and, but even then, uh, you know, regime couldn't think strategically they started to take revenge uh, on uh, the countries that are supporting uh, Belarusian society and uh, started to send uh, illegal, uh, illegal migrants to the borders of uh, Lithuania. And, um, you know, I'm sure that um, European countries want to help, but so as it is our pain, and this is our uh, beloved and people and relatives are in jail suffering from humiliation and uh, ill treatment, it's never enough for us. And I'm sure that European Union can do more, uh, but if there are you know, some doubts about sanctions, I, 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 I'm sure we'll discuss it a little bit more uh, later, but as for uh, assistance to civil society, you know, the answer, the response can be really much uh, stronger because uh, maybe not all the countries uh, understand the scale of the repressions and um, the scale of needs uh, of Belarusian civil society at the moment. So many uh, prisoners inside the country and their relatives need help. But what is more prominent that Lukashenko's regime destroyed mass media inside the country. He's destroying human rights defenders in the country. And a lot of journalists had to flee the country. A lot of people had to flee the country. And all those relicants, all those businesses uh, that uh, uh, were lost in Belarus and also had to be relocated, they need assistance. And, uh, uh, you know, European Union uh, wants Help, but sometimes it helps. It help uh, because of you know some level of bureaucratization. Very slow, but we really need uh, uh, this help to be um, um, emergence, emergence, emergency yeah. help. You know uh, all those money that uh, were 
launched to, to help Belarusians. Uh, for example, in November, they came to, uh, to organizations maybe in, in, in March or April. But people are suffering now. And sometimes it's necessary uh, maybe to, to uh, launch new program, emergency program that will be able to bring this assistance uh, rather fast to, to, uh, to relicants, to organizations that had to flee the country, to help them to restore. And uh, for example, if we take journalists, you know, we had traditional uh, mass media like to buy uh, different local newspapers that are being closed now. But also we have uh, emergent journalists like YouTube channels, Telegram channels, because we have, we, you know, Belarusians have become so creative now. And while closing traditional mass media, we have to uh, open new one to show the truth, to uh, search information inside uh, the country to show the world. And this uh, emergency journalist, journalism uh, need assistance, like uh, you know, technical support to buy equipment to relocate people. And uh, it's it's only one part journalists, but there are, as I already said, businesses, people uh, who flee the country, you know, without nothing, just taking uh, one clothes and, 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 and living in rush. So if it's possible, you know, to reorganize uh, this, reorganize this help, you know, to, to react more effectively and more rapidly, uh, it would be of uh, much appreciated. You know, and, uh, uh, you know, Lithuania um, uh, asked for five, fifth package, uh, fifth package of uh, sanctions. And uh, I hope that European Union will uh, impose those sanctions uh, rather fast, not just delaying this, uh, because, uh, you know, more uh, democratic countries are delaying their response. It's more um, easily for regime to get used to this and, and uh, find ways to bypass uh, those restrictions of, uh, of sanctions. And of course, it's necessary to close loopholes uh, that were um, that were in the uh, in the sectoral sanctions and uh, in the, the fourth uh, sanction list. So we just we have to look at the problem from two sides: pressure on the regime uh, and assistance to civil society. And the European Union can be uh, really helpful. And you know there are problems with uh, sending money to people who are uh, on the ground because regime closed all the um, bank uh, accounts of the people. He they closed uh, borders for you know for for um, traveling you know for for bringing this physical assistance to um, uh, to the country. And we are trying to use uh, technologies to um, provide this assistance to inside country and. Uh, now we see that only um, uh, cryptocurrency is available in Belarus, and European Union is rather, uh, uh, you know, is hesitating uh, about using this this method of uh, uh, sending money. But you know, we have very uncon uh, unconventional uh, situations, so unconventional ways uh, of uh, assistance also have to be launched. You know, just. We are uh, always, uh, you know, uh, trying to assist in this question to European Union representatives to help them to, uh, you know, to uh, transfer this money to people who are in need to give to provide all the information how it's better to do this. But of course, there are problem uh, problems in in, in uh, getting this uh, assistance. But you know, we together with European Union countries do our best to. Um, improve this, this. Thank you very much, Svetlana. Uh, you make very powerful points there about uh, supporting uh, media freedom, about supporting civil society, and de-bureaucratizing -bureau the, the packages of, 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 of sanctions. Uh, I think those points are all very, very well taken. A question from Stephen Frain, who's with the Institute. What is your vision for uh, Belarus sort of eventually taking its place as a free and democratic uh, country within Europe. Do you see it seeking membership of the EU and or the Council of Europe, looking further afield to uh, further ahead to when there is a peaceful transfer of power? What kind of relations do you see Belarus 
to, uh, aspiring to uh, at that point with other European countries? You know, I see uh, new Belarus as safe and prosperous country. And now uh, I don't have right to say what the future we will have according to in relation, in relation to European Union. It's up to Belarusian people to decide. My task and task of Belarusian people now is to bring our country to new elections where they will be able to choose the president they really want and after this to solve uh, all the other questions. We are not, now uh, our strategy is not pro-European or pro-Russian or anti, I don't know, Aust Australian. You know, uh, we have our aim and after gaining this aim, we will decide where to move to the west, east, now, north or south, uh, you know, just uh, I want uh, our country to, uh, I want to return their uh, voices to people. That's our task now. And only then we, uh, you know, we will decide uh, sure. our uh, movements, you know. Yeah. Thanks, Vedana. Um, we have a quite a number of questions coming in uh, about the relationship with Russia, with no surprise, uh, one from, Alan Jukes, who's a former Irish government minister and director general of the Institute. Alan notes that support, for, support from Putin is essential for Lukashenko. What do you think the EU can do to get Putin to change his position? I mean, the, the, the relationship with Russia is very, very complicated. What's your own assessment of that relationship? Um. You know, uh, Putin pressure on uh, Lukashenko's regime and isolating him politically and economically. Uh, you, uh, European countries sending clear message to Kremlin that uh, Lukashenko is toxic, you know, and it's, you should like um, increase the price uh, for Kremlin to, of, of supporting uh, Lukashenko. You know, you, at this very moment, you know, we are not Russia. And we always send this message, we, we should be, uh, our crisis is not uh, like crisis of two countries. We are a separate country. We are not appendix of uh, Russia. And, uh, but of course we all understand that uh, Kremlin influences uh, Lukashenko, first of all. But <clears throat> at this very moment, it's uh, important to, uh, clear, you know, to clarify your position that it's the subject of Belarusian people uh, to fight uh, against the regime, no, it's not, uh, you know, like Russian issue. We don't have to put, uh, you know, like two, how you say in English, two, two, two balls in one basket. Yeah, yes, so, two yeah. eggs in one basket. And uh, on the other hand, you should send clear message that all the deals that are uh, signed between uh, two countries, they are not legit. They are not le legitimate. They are not legal. And will be, of course, um, uh, they can be uh, recalled or, um, you know, in, in the future, you know, because our our country now can be at the threat of losing independence, and independence is uh, the main uh, value for Belarusian people. And we don't know what Lukashenko is doing now behind uh, the curtains. Maybe he's selling enterprises or maybe he's selling our independence. And uh, we want uh, European Union countries to be guarantors that all the deals, uh, you know, will be um, like uh, uh, revised uh, in, 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 in the future. You know, that's it. So, Andrew, one further question, if I may, just about Putin. Do you think that Putin is already looking to the post-Lukashenko situation? I mean, uh, it, it's no secret that there has been no love loss between the two of them over the years. Um, uh, but do you think Russia, in view of the events of the last year, uh, is beginning to shift its own thinking towards who would come after him? And is there is there much speculation about that uh, among Belarus opposition groups. What kind of uh, successor could emerge? Uh, you know, uh, Kremlin supported uh, Lukashenko after fraudulent elections because Kremlin wasn't prepared for such huge uprising also. They didn't um, like prepare uh, their own 
uh, pro-Russian candidate, for example. And uh, now it's uh, not comfortable for Russia to have uh, Lukashenko the power because it means uh, it means uh, um, not not stable situation in Belarus. Uh, but they like can't like afford that uh, democracy will come to Belarus through revolution, through uprising. And we don't see that they have really clear strategy about Belarus now. They are um, continuing to uh, support uh, Lukashenko on diplomatic level. They accept him, they make pictures with uh, uh, him, but obviously this uh, support is not very evident now. They uh, would like to solve this crisis as well, but they don't know how. You know, they understand that Lukashenko is toxic, is uh, not possible, uh, uh, you know, to uh, build normal relationship with person who uh, isn't accepted, not uh, inside the country, not on the international arena, uh, but uh, they have to follow uh, they. Um, like so-called support uh, of him not to not to uh, allow uh, you know democratic forces to win but again it's it's not about russia we all, you know on all our meetings i had to persuade not persuade but to um, underline that we are not part of the russia look we are separate country of course we have uh, uh, bilateral interest but we want to be Russia is our neighbors, uh, and we always will be uh, in trade relationship, with political relationship with them. But we we want to continue this, and uh, but we we want this relationship more transparent and clear in future. And we always uh, send like messages to Russia that we want to talk. We want to see Russia as the part of. Uh, at the mediation table, at the uh, dialogue table, you know, the same as Lithuania, as our uh, other neighbors. We welcome them if they want to be uh, mm, the, uh, you know, the, uh, the, the, they want to be a resolution of the crisis, not to, to deep this crisis, not to freeze this crisis. And, uh, but we, you know, we have to deal with what we have. We continue in our efforts to uh, communicate to representatives of, of Kremlin the same as with the representatives of the regime. We are open for dialogue and we always um, like, uh, um, you, know, you know, showing this. We are not closed. We, are, we, we want to be civilized. We want to find civilized way to resolve the crisis, to think about people, first of all, not about power. Yeah, thank you very much, Svetlana. Um, a lot of questions coming in about uh, Roman Platazovic uh, and his, his partner, Sofia. Can you tell us anything about the latest situation in relation to Roman and what prospects there are of having him uh, released um, from, from custody? You know, Roman is under home arrest now, but home arrest doesn't mean um, freedom and rehabilitation he's still like on the hook if i may say so in english mm -hmm. like, yeah he's uh, uh he's living uh, i suppose in a separate house but he's living for sure with kgb uh, people inside and he's uh, uh, you, you know uh, being monitored by them and uh, you know he's hostage and uh, maybe he, they will use him somewhere once again like uh, as uh, you saw his interviews uh, praising you know Lukashenko but he uh, could be tortured he uh, could be um, threatened uh, I don't know with what uh, they have methods to influence and threat people threaten people so uh, his parent doesn't have uh, any contact with him so uh, we know that uh, uh, relatives maybe of, of Sofia or uh, Raman's relative can bring uh, food to, to, you know, to him. And uh, I hope that he's well, but he don't know for sure. Yeah. So Dana, just still on the subject of <clears throat> um, Lithuania, the migration crisis, or to be more precise, Lukashenko's exploitation of uh, migrants in order to 
put more pressure on on Lithuania. How do you see that uh, uh, impacting on the current situation? For sure, um, Lukashenko uh, and his regime um, wants to take revenge. You know, they want to show that, look, we are uh, so strong, we can do everything we want, we can uh, threat, uh, threaten uh, European society as well. But they are threatening not only Belarus inside country, but also Europeans, uh, European countries. And, uh, you know, European Union is a, a real power. And uh, countries have, have to show their teeth, if I may say so now, and to be consistent in their policy. Lukashenko regime has only violence and such disgusting methods of uh, so-called foreign policy, you know, um, and uh, it's not, uh, it's uh, unacceptable. And European Union has to show their strong answer for these actions and not to return to business as usual as it's happened you know, in previous years. You know, this time should be different and uh, Belarusians are sure that uh, uh, this time we can be success story and they're ready to fight as, as long as possible because people are being jailed and new people appear who replace uh, volunteers, who replace uh, activists and we have very, a small space uh, of acting inside country, but we use every like point of this. Uh, our workers are being uh, organized in uh, striking committees. They are preparing a national wide strike one day. And um, our volunteers, we have a rather big uh, net of volunteers inside country that uh, widespread. We're trying to reach Svetlana again, just a momentary interruption. Yeah, I'm here, sorry. Oh, there you are, great. Yeah, sorry Svetlana, yeah. I think yeah, so so just... I, I wanted to say that people are continuing to fight uh, as much as they can. It's not. It's very difficult, extremely difficult under such pressure. But they understand their responsibility, the responsibility for those who are already uh, in jail. You know, those people sacrificed with their freedom and uh, some uh, with lives, with the health, for for to give us opportunity to continue and we can't betray those people and the democratic society international society also can't betray betray uh, you know prisoners and all the belarusians who understand that uh, uh, we are responsible for the changes but with the help of international community this 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 uh, will be much uh, easier and faster so something like this yeah thanks for that um You've spoken very clearly about what the European Union should do, um, or uh, I'm sure will do. Um, what about the Council of Europe and the OSCE uh, as other organizations with a kind of a human rights remit covering all parts of Europe? Are there particular things you'd like to see the Council of Europe and maybe the OSCE do in support of your activities? You know, we are grateful to all international structures that are trying to help us and the uh, Council of Europe uh, can be really very uh, vocal and uh, supportive to our fight. But uh, I'll, <clears throat> I'll give uh, the word to Franek now just for him to explain the situation. Thank you. Okay. Hi, Franek. Yes, hi. Hi, good afternoon. Um, we are trying to, to mobilize and use leverage OSCE, United Nations, Council of Europe have. Of course, it's very limited, especially considering the fact that uh, Belarus is not a very active member mm. of OSCE and uh, Belarus is not a member of Council of Europe because of death penalty. And this, uh, this makes us in the situation when we want to get Belarus being discussed but it is blocked in an OSC by Russia and by Lukashenko's representatives on one hand. And in the Council of Europe, all the decisions and resolutions, they're not implemented because Belarus, are not, Belarus is not a member of this. But what we see right now, Parliamentary Assembly of OSC uh, issuing resolutions, perhaps uh, doesn't have a direct impact, but it has accumulative effect because it's like, uh, analyzing and giving assessments to the current state of affairs. 
we see Council of Europe uh, presenting reports almost every month on torture, on human rights, on media. And this also helps to show both to Belarusians, to elites, and to the international community that things are not normal in Belarus. So it's also helping a lot. What can be done more? Something like international high-level events. We were trying to, have, to hold such events under um, OSCE auspices, but unfortunately it did not happen because of COVID, but also because, uh, because of uh, some member states were not interested in doing this. But instead of this, we saw um, uh, impressive uh, Moscow mechanism developed by OSCE member states, uh, which didn't need consensus because Moscow mechanism allowed to impose, um, you know, mechanism without without uh, consensus of, of all uh, OSCE member states. And this Moscow mechanism became the basis for many other policies and policies uh, implemented by uh, governments, parliaments, uh, but also different stakeholders, when they went uh, public, they were referring Moscow mechanism. On the United Nations, uh, that's a separate story, United Nations have very different layers that can be uh, in involved. Today, uh, Svetlana has met uh, the special rapporteur on human rights defenders. And yesterday we saw crackdown on human rights defenders. And this is exactly the case where UN special rapporteur can raise awareness to speak out and to uh, help Belarusian human rights defenders to, to, to get the help and attention. UN have Human Rights Council as well. Human Rights Council adopted a resolution which gave special mandate to High Commissioner on Human Rights. But what we have to do, we have to uh, help this uh, experts group created by Michel Bachelet, you know, to, to, to be more efficient, you know, to support it. It's not enough just to launch the framework. It's very important to make this framework working, to make it more practical, so to give it political power only then it will it will it will be working. And sometimes, you know, uh, very like, negative thing, and we're disappointed that many things are um, are, are when are, are discussed regarding Belarus when there is media attention, and then when media attention is going down, you know, there is no more political will. This political will is disappearing, and it's very difficult to keep uh, this attention span um, on a high level. Thank you very much, Anik. Can I come to a question from Shona Murray of Euronews? Um, Shona asks, what would it take for new and fair elections to materialize? I mean, this obviously is, is uh, one of your major objectives, Svetlana. Um, I, we've read about supposed efforts by our supposed intentions on Lukashenko's part to bring in a, a new constitutional reforms and referendums. I mean, to be honest, we've been there before. Uh, I'm sure there's a lot of skepticism about that, but what do you think it will actually take to uh, to bring about the fair elections that you have demanded? You know, uh, we uh, in uh, Belarus uh, think that only um, consistency will bring us to new elections. We have to follow our strategy uh dialogue and new elections and we are preparing for this no we are in process of uh, revolution of course but we are thinking uh, about uh, transition period and about future as well we had a wonderful conference on uh, uh, new elections and uh, uh, we estimated that uh, new elections can be held uh in 40, in 40 days uh, after you know some changes uh, will happen just we uh, will be prepared for transition period. We will be prepared for uh, new elections and uh, the period after elections. It will be, you know, it, it's, I have to repeat this, pressure, uh, assistance to civil society for them to survive uh, and to be sustainable, uh, you know, at the moment to continue their fight. And, uh, you know, regime is making mistakes, you know, and uh, it's also, it can happen very quickly. We, it seems maybe that nothing is happening uh, uh, in Belarus, but the situation is changing constantly. And uh, you know, who knows what could uh, um, influence the situation? Nobody expected uh, Rana uh, plane hijacking. Nobody expected this uh, this flow of uh, migrants to Lithuania. Nobody knows uh, what what 
new uh, Lukashenko will invent in the country that will raise people again. You know, maybe he will, uh, I don't know, decrease the wages of workers and they will, uh, you know, go, go out for strikes. You know, there can be a lot of scenarios of this, but we will, our task is to be prepared for the moment when, when quick changes uh, will, um, you know, have to be uh, done. Okay, sorry for my, for my English. And uh, like we are doing everything now, we are uh, preparing a um, new constitution and this constitution is being discussed by all the people. It's not, it's not done behind the curtains as, as the regime always did. And now they are pretending they are uh, also working on a new constitutional reform, but it's all, it's all uh, can I say bluff? You know, yeah, they are yes. not going to, yeah, they are not going to do anything. Is they are just like, want to keep more time to, to, to keep the regime in the power and, uh, only our strong actions, joint actions inside the country and joint actions of uh, all the democratic countries, the USA and the European Union countries. You know, you, European Union and the USA looking at each other. You know, what will be the next step of, of uh, uh, European Union? Who will be braver? So we will join their sanctions, you know, and um, uh, you know that uh, inside Belarus, all the processes are, are going on because uh, all those businesses who now are supporting uh, regime, they understand that, um, uh, you know, regime is toxic now and uh, all those sanctions can impose uh, businesses of these businessmen and they have to choose. Uh, should they continue uh, supporting uh, this strange person who is acting, uh, you know, such, uh, oh, uh, you know, in, 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 in immoral way? Or should they uh, pay attention to new Belarus and join a civil society? You know, at least not, they can't, they may not support Lukashenko at the moment. They can um, change their attitude to him. And they know that uh, they, uh, you know, these businesses have already experienced that in past, even if you are a friend of Lukashenko, he easily can put you in jail in a couple of months. Everybody is under threat, supporting the regime, not supporting one mistake and you are in jail, even from, from, from those who are uh, loyal to this regime. And we have to show, uh, you know, now we are talking about sanctions, ab about all those atrocities and violence. It's so painful, but we have to look into the future as well. We have to show new Belarus. And this comprehensive plan that was launched by European Union was, uh, was ac accepted with gratitude inside Belarus. Because for 27 years, uh, you know, the regime told us nobody... Hmm. I'm here, I hope Svetlana will rejoin. Okay, we can hear you, Vanna, can we? Questions. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. Um, let me just put one, uh, Vanek, which has come from Philip Beck of the IIA. Um, is there a role for Irish professionals who, who, would, who would adopt similar Belarus professionals who are political prisoners through organizations like uh, Liberico, Amnesty International and so on, such as teachers, teacher to teacher, engineer to engineer, doctor to doctor? The background is that there have been recent reports about Irish politicians doing this, and this is very encouraging. So the question really is, uh, it, 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 it wants to see whether that could be done on a broader scale. Uh, adoption of political prisoners became the, the, the super action which united many parliaments around the world uh, on both sides of the Atlantic. And uh, it's helped to raise awareness not only about the prominent figures, not only about presidential candidates, but also about regular uh, men and, and, and women, uh, doctors, teachers, people of different professions and ages uh, who were kidnapped and jailed by Lukashenko's regime. Um, there, there are some other initiatives uh, that also allow foreigners to help Belarusian civil society and political prisoners. For example, uh, it's possible to buy uh, food packages for political prisoners online. 
So for example, you want to help uh, the family, you can go online, you can pay the, for the package and the volunteers on the ground will uh, form this package and will give to the prisoner you want to, you want to support and help. Also, we, we encourage different uh, civic groups, especially universities, schools, high schools, uh, professional associations to help their peers, colleagues uh, in Belarus. Sometimes uh, with teachers, doctors, workers, it's much easier because there are formed institutions. But in some like new, uh, with, with some specific professions, it could be difficult to find peers. So uh, in case if you are uh, represented like popular um, profession like doctor, we recommend you to find them or to support or to get in touch with the uh, fund, medical solidarity fund, which was formed and, and there after events last August. And which allows, which which help doctors who were repressed by Lukashenko's regime. You can find these initiatives online, but also we will be happy on the, on the website of Svetlana Tikhanovskaya. Um, you can you can check at tikhanovskaya.org, but we will be also happy to to share, you know, the contacts for different groups and whom to help, with whom to be in touch. But again, I think youth, especially high schools, universities, universities could be uh, could be mutually beneficial for Belarusians to feel the support, but for foreigners also to learn. Uh, from Belarusians, what they feel, what they are getting through, and uh, especially for high school uh, students in Ireland, I think it will be an uh, important experience to, to get um, to hear directly from young people in Belarus what they what they suffer, what they think about, what they feel. Thank you, Vanek. Svetlana, we're coming towards the end um, uh, of this um, of this session, and uh, uh, I just wanted really to come back to what you would like Ireland to do. Uh, you've, you've said it at the beginning, uh, you've sketched out a number of things on which we can be helpful. And uh, I'm sure that colleagues at the Irish Mission to the UN will have noted what you said about an area formula meeting. I think that, that, that makes a lot of sense. Um, we uh, are on the Security Council at the moment, as you know, and uh, I'm sure that uh, thought would be given to ways in which we can support um, the 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 uh, moves towards peaceful uh, political change in in Belarus. Um, is there anything you'd like to say finally, just directed specifically at, at Ireland? Um, uh, uh, we are obviously part of the uh, consideration of sanctions within the EU, uh, and you've ha had meetings with the Taoiseach and the uh, the the Foreign Minister this week. Um, but is there anything that you, are there any messages for the Irish people that you would like to close off with? Uh, you know, uh, all the political messages uh, I uh, declared in my uh, speech, you know, about uh, uh, putting children of political prisoners in your Chernobyl uh, program, you know, for children who couldn't visit Ireland and have rest about, um, uh, about, um, Area formula about assistance to Belarusians, but uh, you asked about Irish people, ordinary people. You know, really a lot can be done. And uh, for example, when yesterday I was at uh, my host family, I asked Henry Dean. You know, he uh, visits church uh, every day, and I told him to print uh, uh, the addresses of uh, prisons where political prisoners are situated and give it to every person who is in church in church, and say them, right, come home and write a letter to political prisoner. It will take 10 minutes of your life, but it will make the whole day for those who are behind the bars. They are so happy to receive letters from, from people, especially abroad. You know, it can be done in universities, in uh, in uh, uh, in, school, in high schools. You know, you can even organize uh, such lectures uh, when where you talk about democracy that you are got used to it you stop to value this but there are countries that are uh, where people losing their lives and freedom just uh, you know fighting for uh, these values you can support those those people and uh, let, leave uh, 10 minutes uh, of this lecture for writing letters it's very very important step usual people can uh, tweet uh, retweet uh, our messages can be um, can uh, be active in on instagram for example to promote the uh, idea of uh, belarusian people and never be afraid to make uh, a small step because when we are millions there are already millions of step 
uh, millions of steps. So uh, I ask Irish people to be with us and it's better to do something than not to do uh, anything at all. So uh, I'm really grateful for those who are already doing something and I'm great grateful for those who uh, will find a strength and uh, do something else or something, you know, or open some something new in themselves. And um, because, uh, you know, I, I had to repeat that we believe that Belarus can be success story. And I ask you to be the part uh, of this, uh, you know, success path to uh, democracy. Svetlana, thank you so much for a very powerful and, and disturbing, I have to say, account of what's happening in Belarus at the moment and of the, of, of the uh, challenges which you and your colleagues uh, as Democrats are facing. We on this call have benefited greatly from your insights, but also your inspiration and from the generosity with which you have answered the questions. Thanks also to, to Vranek. We've covered a lot of ground. We've taken a lot of your time. But I, I'm sure I speak on behalf of everybody for, in, in thank you warmly for what you've told us, and especially with those parting messages, which uh, I'm sure strike home for all of us. Lovely to see you in Ireland again, and, and uh, we look forward to seeing you hopefully in person uh, on a future occasion. In the meantime, uh, warmest thanks um, and solidarity with everything that, that you, you and your colleagues are doing. Thank you for thank being with us. Thank you, gentlemen and ladies, for your attention. Goodbye.